I think we're live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, whether you're watching this now or in the future. We thank you so much for joining us today. Today is the inaugural Big Ideas webinar from Trotec Laser. My name is Don. I am the Consumables Manager here, and I am lucky enough today to be your host for this very first Big Ideas webinar. I'm really, really excited. I'm joined by the ever-impressive Mike Clark. How are you, Mike? Thanks, you guys Don. know Mike. <laughs> if, you've, if you've watched any of our content, you definitely know Mike. Uh, Mike's been in the laser business for some time. Um, he uh, he is our expert on all things laser, particularly here in our Mississauga office. So we would encourage you, uh, as you're tuning in, obviously to, to drop us a hello in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. And also, if you have any questions uh, for Mike or our other panelists, we would really appreciate if you would drop those into the chat. We always love getting to interact with you. And that is uh, part of the reason we're here today. Uh, the other big reason, obviously, is because we really want to uh, hear from our very esteemed panelists, our experts, on uh, their businesses, what it is that they've been going through in recent months to tell us a little bit about their history, where they're at now, where they see themselves in the future, all those great things, and to hopefully have a great roundtable discussion with you. Um, first and foremost, then, I don't want to delay any longer. I want to get started right away. Let's bring in, first and foremost, Tristan from TDH. How are you, sir? I'm well. You, you guys? Very well, thank Good. you. You're in uh, British Columbia, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so we're based in uh, well, the Lower Mainland. Uh, our shop itself is in South Surrey, uh, right beside the U.S. border, but uh, we primarily service Vancouver. It's all within kind of a 35, 40 minute drive. Um, and yeah, we're um, you know we've kind of got a 7,000 square foot facility here. We started as a neon shop about 30 years ago. We did a lot of the neon up and down uh, Granville Street in, in Vancouver. Wow. Um, and then it's kind of transformed into a, a full fabrication shop uh, with a really kind of talented team of, you know, welders and, um, you know, people who do paint or woodwork or, or all those different things. And um, we focus on signs, displays, industrial arts uh, type projects. And we kind of take on the projects that, uh, or we like to take on the projects that others can't do. And uh, very excited today to, to show one of our uh, uh, I'd say one of our more challenging projects. There's a lot of challenge or technical challenges to it. So kind of excited to, to share that with everyone here. I'm excited to see it. I know, um, I mean, certainly all of the panelists that we have on this morning are uh, experts in their field, but uh, I know certainly I wanted to have an opportunity and I'm so glad we have the website up here on the screen because I was browsing through uh, the website this morning and you guys have some fantastic work in your portfolio, particularly um, sort of neon driven in some cases. I wanted to ask about that and I'm, I'm yeah, here's a, just a fantastic piece. I mean, the intricacy of something like that must be, I mean, not knowing anything about the fabrication of neon aside from the fact that I know it is incredibly difficult. <laughs> uh, you know, what, are the, what does the, the manufacturing of a piece like that look like, uh, you know, when you're working with, uh, with TDH and then, um, you know, the installation of it as well, I imagine must be quite involved. Yeah, well, we I'd say there's a lot of planning that goes into these projects, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, uh, if we were to go back for the to the Neon Tiger project, and if you ever go to Kelowna, definitely stop by Skinny Dukes and and check it out. Um, so there is a lot of planning that goes into it. You know, we have to plan where the neon units are going. You know, the overall shape of it. Uh, there's also a lot of talent um, that goes into you know wrapping a shape like that. So. You know, the overall tiger shape, if you look at the aluminum cabinet behind it, might be, um, uh, you know, CNC cut, for example. Right. And then the uh, actual build of it, it's very much, you know, an art from, you know, some people who have been learning this trade and this craft over, over many, many years in terms of how to put that together, how to fit i think there's five or six neon transformers in the back of that thing in the way that it's serviceable that's always an issue when you're you're working in the sign industry is you have to make it very serviceable that you can pull it apart and you know replace a transformer if you need to uh, there's bending all the neon um you know there's uh, that's very much an art form there's no machine that can do any of that work and then uh, mounting and putting it all together is you know you kind of have a bit of a paper pattern but there's a lot of skill and judgment that goes into that as well you know, making all the pieces fit together, all the electrical go in and look nice. There is, yeah, a lot of different pieces that have to come together. Certainly, yeah. Well, and that was what I was going to sort of ask about. I mean, you know, without wishing to make a, a, a generalization, I want to say that 
you know, especially this morning, it occurred to me as I was browsing through uh, the websites of, of, you know, each of our panelists that, um, you know, Signcraft in particular really does have this wonderful mix of uh, just raw creative design with sort of functionality and real world, you know, sort of in place, you know, touch it, feel it sort of um, installation art in a way. Um, you know, so much of the work that we are fortunate here to do at Trotech ends up being, you know, beautiful wall mounted pieces. Uh, but we we sort of have to use a different part of our brain sometimes when we're thinking about materials that have to actually go outside and live in the outdoors for any amount of time, right? And you guys have this wonderful combination of both, it seems to me, that, as you said, somebody, there's no machine that can do that work. There's somebody there who not only needs to make something that's going to help to promote, you know, Skinny Dukes, but at the same time is going to be a, a functional, you know, beautiful piece of art in a way, a piece of design. Absolutely. Yeah, it takes a lot of talented people uh, working together properly planned out to, to make all the pieces fit. Um, would, would you have looked after the installation on that, Tristan, or was that done by somebody else? Uh, no, we did the installation as well. Um, so, you know, we have crews that will, that do go on site. Um, yep. I think there's some challenges with that building. It's an old brick building, so we had to put some structure inside, uh, mount, um, uh, you know, brackets on both sides, bolt it all together. Um, and yeah, we go out with, uh, you know, cranes and bucket trucks and yeah. all that kind of stuff to, to make it work. Then you had to get a permit for that too, I take it, right? So, yep, we, we handled all the permitting process as well. That's not the most exciting stuff, but <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's the, you know, that's the thing that people don't understand is the, like, you know, remember we had, uh, buddy, uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, and people just don't understand what goes into these. Just yeah. a simple, the sign is beautiful and, and the sign it alone is, is impressive, but the amount of work that's done in the background is, what? is enormous. Yeah. It can be hard to appreciate that maybe for the passerby, right? But that's what was, I was so struck by, um, you know, sort of in getting to look through so much signage and, and you know, the way not only that each um, each designer or each shop has their own style that kind of comes through, but then also the way that they, you know, that they reflect even um, the difference between what you might see, like you said, sort of in Vancouver to what you might see in, you know, downtown Toronto to what you might see on the East Coast, for example. I mean, there's sort of like a reflection of the area as well, right? Um, I, I don't know. It's amazing. I, I have a mention here too in the chat about that you were potentially, uh, you had a nomination, a, a BOCSI nomination, I believe, for that particular yeah. sign. Yes, it's uh, in the running for the Canadian Sign Awards, which the award presentation is another webinar tonight. So this is webinar number one of two for me today. Yeah, we're hoping. Good luck. Um, Good yes, luck. we're hoping to win on that. Congratulations. Yeah, well, I shall I shall do my best to live up to <laughs> those high standards then, certainly. Um, it, with that in mind, though, I should, I would also like to introduce our second panelist, Helena, who is joining us from Sinex in Manitoba. How are you, Helena? I'm doing well, thank you. Awesome, I'm so pleased that I got your name correct because anytime I'm doing my best to say someone's name correct, that's inevitably the time when I goof. Right, Moak, Moak Clark? Um, now, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, as Tristan was sort of mentioning, there are so many talented people who end up working together to sort of bring together um, something that may, you know what I mean? Like it's a, a sign is sort of maybe perhaps thought of as, uh, you know, first and foremost, kind of, um, you know, a, a business expenditure, it's something that the, you know, the observer sees, and it has to communicate clearly and that sort of thing. But uh, in browsing through your site this morning, Helena, it really struck me that sort of aspect of, you know, the super talented team of people all working together. I mean, you should tell us a little bit about Sinex and uh, sort of your origins and, and, you know, how you how do you approach a new project, you know, that comes across your desk? Well, we are located in Steinbach, Manitoba. So it's a small community, just 45 minutes outside of Winnipeg. Um, Sinex started as kind of um, a side business as, from an electrical company. So we have deep roots in the electrical industry. Obviously, we're going to do a lot of illuminated signs. But um, in 1982, the demand became so great um, for that electrical company that it split and formed Sinex. So we've been doing, um, I guess that almost makes us at 40 years uh, in the business of making signs. So uh, we've grown a lot, obviously. When I started, it was um, me and maybe two or three other people. Now we have 
close to 20 people in production fabrication, um, a lot of front end staff and um, installation. So yeah, we've we've grown and to do amazing projects, uh, come together as a team. It's been um, quite a ride. We're very excited uh, to what we have done and what we can do in the future. Um, 100%. Um, and, and as I guess one of our highlights is the CMHR project. I'm not sure if we're going to be talking about that right now, but um, uh, we have lots of large projects that we've done. Obviously, the IKEA building that was, uh, uh, and at the same time, actually, as the IKEA building, we were doing um, investors group field. So that one we took um, investors group field. We took right from concept. We developed all of the signage and all the designs for it, as well as manufactured and install, installed everything. So yeah, it's 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 exciting to see what uh, what we can all do. And uh, um, as a sign company, we're just um, you know always looking for new ways to help our customers. Um, we don't see problems; we see innovation. We see uh, opportunities for us to just um, help see, provide what our clients need. So that's the exciting part. <clears throat> Absolutely. No, I think it comes across in your work. It's interesting that you say about having background as an electrical, like Trotec uh, Laser, believe it or not, began as an offshoot of a, a stamp making company. Trotat, mm -hmm. our sister company, we, we began making lasers simply because they couldn't find a, a means of they couldn't find a laser that delivered the level of quality that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some 20 or 30 years later, here we are as a laser manufacturer across the entire globe. So certainly <laughs> we can really appreciate, you know, um, I have to ask. So uh, you mentioned about certainly doing a lot of illuminated signs. Would you say that that is sort of uh, the specialty of Sinex? Do you have, you know, a type of project that you're really, really, I mean, certainly you bring the same level of passion to every project, but it's, is there something that you consider sort of a specialty of the, of, of the shop? You know what, um, basically custom. Uh, we have a lot of architects come to us <clears throat> and uh, re like they have an idea and what we try to do is help them flesh out that idea and um, <clears throat> with the materials that we use primarily, which are acrylics and metals and, and LEDs, that sort of thing. So we really try to um, work together, try to co create this collaborative environment so that we can um, yeah, just see what we can do. Um, we also have a lot of our suppliers on on board as well, like just trying to source out stuff for us as, and um, to provide the solution and the sign that uh, that everybody wants. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, last question I have to ask. I was so so blown away by um, the uh, well the the project that we were just showing on stream here the 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 field. Um, do you have to approach a project of that scale differently than you would sort of like a, a singular installation or is it the same process investors group field here it is thank you um would you approach it sort of in the same way or because you mentioned about having to design all of the signage across the entire sort of uh the entire building so i'm curious whether you would approach that you know slightly differently given the, the scope and scale or if it would be sort of just you know business as usual at signex no problem an entire football field is easy well, this is definitely something that we have to back up even further from our, our normal tenders or our normal projects because we're determining pedestrian flow, um, how to guide people into certain areas, uh, what kind of signage is important at those points um, to direct people. And so that kind of is usually done in the front, end, like before we get a project, but because we had to develop all of that, um, it was a learning process for us um, just on that scale alone because uh, I think on a regular day when our installers were on site, they probably they put on like 20 miles uh, just walking around that place. It it was a workout. <laughs> wow. I was going to say, we, if only we knew some, some, you know, football players perhaps who might be in good shape that could help you guys. To <laughs> That and uh, wearing steel-toed boots and uh, you, know, you have your, your whole weight system going. It's, it was a good workout. <laughs> um, last but not least, I would very much like to introduce Dave, who is joining us from Westmount Signs in uh, uh, 
uh, Kitchener Waterloo, if I'm not mistaken, right? Kitchener Waterloo area. Yeah, correct. Fantastic. Correct. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about sort of uh, Westmount? What makes you guys special? Sort of the the history of the company. Um, you know, what might we what might we know that you guys have, have done recently? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. Um, Westmount Signs have uh, been around for about 15 years, uh, started out as more of a smaller um, print and digital printing shop, and then um, over the years moved into uh, more signage, exterior signage, and interior signage, and then um, uh, developing more of the laser side of the business, and we do have electrical as well. Um, so we like to think of ourselves as more of a... Um, you know, a one-stop shop for, you know, from your business cards to promotion materials, websites, uh, all your interior signage that you might need to exterior. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I think that's one of one of our, uh, I guess, why, why people love working with us because they can get, they can get their large exterior sign or if they just need their smaller business cards, we, we know the branding, we know um, what they're looking for already um, with with our designers and, and our team. Um, and the project that I want to talk about today, it's not as large um, or it's not one of our larger jobs, um, but it encompasses all of our the exterior signage of the building and the interior signage as well. Um, so there's a number of different signs that we did just to kind of uh, show the I guess the different signs and there is kind of a lasering uh, component to each of the signs and uh, that job it's from uh, Greystone, uh, Greystone Racket Club, which they just did their rebranding um, and, and they had new owners. So I'm not sure if you have any photos of that. Um, we may very well. I know. Um, I know. Certainly, we're going to have an opportunity to get to see sort of a, a featured product, uh, a featured project. Part of me here from from each of you. Perhaps that's. Oh, a, okay. Gotcha. I didn't know. That was, to, yeah, to sort of uh, pop chat. along. I, I did want to ask. So, um, sure. would you be able to tell us a little bit? Now, this is something obviously that uh, you know interests Mike and I a great deal. But um, you have two locations, I believe, right? You have one that was sort of more on the, the printing side that I believe is the, the kitchen location, and then one that is sort of more on the, if I'm, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of on the sign side that's in the, the Waterloo location. Yeah. Um, what sort of differentiates, I mean, aside from like, say, just sort of the, the what I just explained, <laughs> you know, what, what type of work would you be doing in each of those and sort of what machines might live in each location? Yeah, so our kitchen location, uh, that's where all of the, um, the print, is done i guess just paper print so you have your business cards uh you have your promotional flyers your booklets um your uh, annual reports those uh those types of projects would be done there and then at a waterloo location you have more of the digital printing uh vinyl or the larger sign sign fabrication and, and our laser machines those are there as well so, very cool yeah. I, I should say we are we are uh, very fortunate as much as uh, Dave is uh, one of our customers. So we may have, uh, if you have any Georgia Glazer questions, we may throw some of them to him as well in order that he can, uh, he can give his sort of on the boots on the boots on the ground experience with a Trotec laser. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you won't mind too much. No, not at all, which is great. <laughs> um, so wanting to, you know, not to, uh, to tease our, our audience too much, I really would love to bring up some of the, uh, the presentations and some of the, the images that uh, our panelists have been so kind as to prepare for us. Once again, I should remind you, if you're just tuning in, um, you know, we have these three incredible experts on with us today for about an hour, a little bit over an hour. So if you have any questions, if you ever want to know about, I mean, manufacturing, sign manufacturing, installs, uh, CNC machines, laser machines, all that sort of stuff, uh, this is a great opportunity to get to ask them a question. Uh, if you're a small business owner, a big business owner, uh, is there a medium business? I never hear anyone talk. I own a medium business. Uh, you know, please, by all means, drop us uh, drop us a question in the chat. We'd be happy to throw it out there. Um, so uh, really quickly, returning back to Tristan, uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the, the Great Northern Way campus that uh, we have on screen here? It is something special, I think. Yeah, so this was a really interesting project for us. Um, I'd say it was a really challenging project. There's a lot of build uh, challenges to it. Uh, it's located at the Emily Carr campus. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's the Arts University in Vancouver. Um, so if you go around the campus, there's quite a bit of um, 
you know, very architecturally interesting pieces, as you can see with the, you know, tomato flower shaped building behind. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a bunch of things that, uh, you know, we, I suppose, in terms of what the architects were looking for here, I, I think kind of the major challenges that I'll, I'll kind of talk through here, um, it, it's uh, the form that they were looking here is a twisting, uh, type shape that kind of, as it goes up, it twists. There's no right angles through it, apart from the very top and the very bottom, which is kind of a very challenging thing. Um, maybe if we just go back to the previous slide and then we'll get into how we designed it. Um, uh, other challenges that we kind of were having to overcome with this is coming up with the some really nice illumination. Uh, so if you look at kind of the band of uh, illuminated acrylic that's going down the side. How do you make that illuminate really nicely without any shadows, hot spots, that type of stuff, considering the structural challenges that we also had to face um, making this stand up and not fall down. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's a lot of work and thought that also went into the um, uh, court and finishing. As you'll know, this is court and steel that we're working with. Very interesting material as it changes over time with the weather, uh, particularly here on the uh, the uh, the west coast where we've got a lot of rainstorms and, and stuff like that that are well, particularly today in Vancouver where it's like crazy rain, rainstorm in Pumbledore right now. Um, uh, it's going to have an effect on this over time, and that that steel is, is going to change, which is really really cool. Um, so that is, that is cool. I will say I hadn't even considered that, but that's certainly particularly in a climate. I mean. Uh, you know, obviously Manitoba and Ontario have their own sort of climate challenges, but in a climate where there is so much rain and so much sort of humidity all the time, having to take that into account when you you install something like this has got to be a, a, a major challenge in terms of just material selection. But yeah, the material selection in this case, it's meant to rest. So Portland steel by its nature is a weathering steel. Um, so it, it naturally rusts and changes over time. Uh, so you'll notice it's kind of a... Um, you know, a bit of a lighter orange here. If you go look at it uh, today on site, um, you know, it's good to have turned to a darker shade of rust. Uh, when we first installed it, it was kind of a bit of a bright orange. It's meant to rust over time. And uh, like one of the things that we were going through here is there's a bunch of other port and steel that were was installed elsewhere on site before us. Um, and that had been weathering out in the elements for a good year and a half before we, we put this in. Uh, so one of the things that we, we tried to do is try to accelerate our aging process um, to make it match those existing elements on site as best we could or keep catch up to it. So it's a bit of kind of chemical that we did to, to make that happen. I will say uh, too, I, I just wanted to mention, I was struggling to describe the building that you see in the background there, but I think tomato flower may be the best <laughs> sort of <laughs> simile for, please, please, I'd love to see more. I just, I had to acknowledge what a great, <laughs> what a great observation that was. It, it's, it's supposed to be a flower. Um, we, we like to call it a tomato. <laughs> like it. <laughs> it's, it's certainly, yeah, very architecturally interesting for sure. It's, Did you cut all the steel, Tristan? Sorry? Did you cut all the steel? Yes. Um, so uh, I'll, maybe if uh, we start uh, switching slides, I'll kind of tell you how this all went together. So, and I think when uh, I kind of introduced myself there and we were talking about the, the Neon Tiger, for example, we, we kind of said that there's a lot of planning that goes into this. Um, so this was actually a good six months of back and forth with the architects to come up with how will this will be built. They had a very specific form in mind. Uh, they wanted very specific things as it comes to illumination. And I'd say probably hit a bit of a brick wall when we kind of told them, well, you know, we, we have to, to, you know, make this structurally sound. Um, it had to be engineered. So, you know, I had to have the right structure in it that's not going to never fall down. And then all the challenges in terms of making this illuminate nicely. Um, so how do you deal with that? There's a lot of back and forth. Uh, you know, we did a lot of 3D modeling. Uh, figuring out the placement of the support structure that goes inside of this um, to make sure that it's it's solid and it's going to last, you know, 50 years or whatever it needs to. Um, and then the other one, and you can kind of see it if you look, kind of look at the lower uh, bottom photo or the middle bottom photo. Uh, we had a lot of discussion around how do we make this illuminate nicely um, where you know, we don't have any shadows behind it. How do you attach that acrylic 
Um, so those are all kind of considerations and we kind of had to put in these keepers and stuff like that to, uh, to make it look nice, but still, um, uh, you know, uh, be able to catch it. Um, so if we, uh, and, and then basically we took this 3D model and then it all got mapped into 2D. So all the different pieces, um, which uh, basically, you know, if we look at the five, six, five panel at the top that got mapped into 2D and went for cutting. Uh, so maybe if we flip to the next side, we can see how it starts to come together. Um, so there's a couple of different uh, cutting ma uh, machines or techniques that were used. Uh, the court in itself was water jet cut, gives us nice clean uh, uh, inside corners that are sharp. Uh, the downside to water jet cutting for us always is that um, it leaves marks uh, as the uh, water jet is focusing. So there's, there's um, little marks on the, the metal or steel, which if you're finishing a piece is not a problem. Um, you know, when we get to kind of the tenant panels later, uh, that had a bit of a different consideration. We're using raw materials that need to be finished, so it requires a different technique. Um, and yeah, you can see here as we're kind of starting to put it together, we're building a steel structure inside, doing a lot of work to make sure that seams are nicely finished, welded and grinded, so it's nice and smooth. And we'll kind of talk a little bit as we kind of get further into how we make those disappear. Um, all good, any questions so far? Well, I wanted to, yeah, if I could just stop you really quickly. Uh, we have a question here from Stefan, who, uh, I mean, thank you so much for watching Stefan. We really appreciate it. Everyone else in the chat, thank you so much for joining us. Um, he asked about specifically uh, lasers and wattage, but uh, because you brought up water jet, I wanted to ask you if you could give us sort of just sort of a, a general idea of what sort of materials you might be working with on the water jet. And then I'm sure we'll see more as we go, but I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, you know, what types of machines, particularly, um, you know, large manufacturing equipment that you would have in the shop and be using sort of day in and day out? Yeah, so in the shop using day in, day out, we actually run a CNC here. Um, when it comes to other tools, you know, lasers, water jet, uh, plasma, um, would be kind of the other three that we use on a somewhat regular basis. It really comes down to uh, the job and, um, you know, what we're taking on and then finding the right, um, tool for it. So we don't have those machines in house. Uh, we've got, we're lucky to have um, a couple of companies within a few blocks that um, have those available. So we, we call them up and, and send them over. Um, so uh, water jet, for example, uh, you know, if we're cutting uh, thick steel, thick aluminum, uh, anything over, uh, you know, quarter inch, which would handle in house, uh, then we, we tend to get a water jet cut and we, we send it, it's literally across the street. I've got five water jet machines that comes back to us in three or four days. Um, so it's in just the, the volume, as I said, we, we take on unusual projects, which means we're always finding different solutions to, um, to do things. So, um, you know, it's like, oh, I need water jet one day, I need laser another day. It, it, we, we don't always, you know, it doesn't justify having, you know, huge machines each for the volume that we do for each of those in house. So it's, it's kind of finding, um, you know, like we've, we've got uh, um, a couple of guys that are just up the street that have Trotec uh, laser machines. So we, we use them for a bunch of laser stuff. No, I, yeah, I can appreciate that. Like uh, prioritizing the project and the, the customer first and foremost yeah. above all, you can, I can certainly appreciate that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is uh, starting to come together. So you can kind of see uh, the court in its raw form. You can kind of see it's grinded down. Uh, like if you look on the right-hand picture, you can see the seam just below the 565. Obviously, that's something that we don't want in the, the finished product. They wanted a nice seamless uh, kind of design. So we'll talk about finishing that. Um, but yeah, you can, it's, it's, this was very much a, uh, you know, a project that was kind of hand, uh, and, you know, yes, all the panels were cut out by uh, water jet, but actually putting it together was, you know, uh, done by a, a welder, very much done by hand with like squares and uh, angle measurements, trying to, to make it all work. Um, uh, if we look at here, so uh, actually, let's go back to that slide. Uh, yeah, right there. Um, so kind of the next thing that we had to figure out a little bit, there's a couple of things going on here. Uh, firstly, putting the uh, acrylic in. All the acrylic in this case was CNC cut. Um, the 
you know, since CNC is a mechanical thing, it allows us to put a lip on it. Um, but then uh, we can do uh, the 565 as a push through so it's flush. Um, so that you have acrylic running along the back so you don't see any light leaks on it, which is important for us. And then we're also starting to mount all the acrylic pieces up the side. And then uh, the cord itself, you can see that it's um, uh, orange. Uh, so that's kind of the first stages of re resting cord and steel. So we got it sandblasted before we mounted the acrylic. And then uh, we've kind of got an aging solution that we've come up in house to um, uh, pre-rest steel. Um, so it's usually easy to make things look new, but to make things look old, uh, you get a, have a bit of fun with it. You know, what would the weather have done over time? And, you know, we're kind of playing with the solution to try to make it uh, look like as if it's, it's uh, been out in the weather for a while. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, and, and the other advantage of it hides all our, our grinding and seams and all that kind of stuff, gives you a nice seamless look. That's a hundred percent. What would you say, uh, so you mentioned about using the uh, the CNC machine for acrylic cutting. Um, you know, what would you say are sort of the, the major advantages of using, uh, using a CNC for, for something like that? And then, uh, you know, any, any sort of disadvantages or any areas in which uh, you might look towards another uh, technology? Yeah, so uh, in this case specifically, as I said, um, since CNC is mechanical, you can cut a lip around the acrylic and then fit it through from the back. So you have a lip that prevents any light leaks around it. Uh, you can't do that with laser. Um, you know, CNC can handle some types of materials, some thicknesses, like for us, we don't go over really like quarter inch aluminum. We can't handle steel on it. Um, those, you know, so in those cases, it's either laser or um, water jet that can handle those scenarios. Um, uh, you know, CNC in other cases, inside corners, if you want a really sharp inside corner, if we actually flip to the next slide, um, says, yeah, if we look at the tenant panels here, if you look at say Blackbird Interactive, um, those are really kind of tight uh, and really needs to be really sharp cor inside corners on say, if you look on the I or the N, um, you know, a CNC bit would not be able to get in there and do that. That's something that had to be laser for that reason. Um, and water, and the other thing with this here is that's raw to be stainless steel. Um, the client really wanted the raw steel look, uh, not something we could do with water jet. Uh, right. Water jet will leave a mark on it when it focuses the, the water jet beam. So laser in this case was the way to go. Gotcha. I would ask so um, specifically. And then, the yes, you see like the site is floating, so it's backed up. Oh, please go ahead, please, yeah. Sorry? Oh, please go ahead, yeah. I was just saying that, like, you can see the site on um, Cinesite is floating, but so it's all backed up by acrylic, uh, which would have been cut by uh, CNC, uh, just because that's easy to, to do on a CNC. I would ask, um, so you mentioned sort of a acrylic cutting on a CNC. Uh, what might be the, the principal materials that you would use the, the water jet and the, the laser for? I guess the, the laser is sort of perhaps, as you suggested, for more sort of intricate um, cuts that, that the CNC wouldn't be ideal for, but then I assume the laser jet, or pardon me, the laser jet, the water jet, um, I say the word laser so much every day, you wouldn't believe, uh, the, the water jet would be principally for cutting uh, steel and, and as you say, sort of metal materials? Yeah, so we'd mostly use water jet for, you know, aluminum that's more than a quarter inch thick and any kind of steel, which we can't do on CNC. Laser, as you kind of said, is the, the finer detail stuff. Um, so we'll get uh, acrylic laser cut if we're doing, you know, like small letters or something like that, um, or, you know, aluminum or steel if, if we need something where, uh, again, there's that fine detail work to it. Makes sense. I mean, it's a beautiful piece. Is there, I was going to say, I was hoping that we would see it lit up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so, and another challenge, uh, so this is kind of the stage where we're, we're fitting all the LEDs. So uh, light dispersion is a, is a challenge. Um, it's, it's hard to see in the previous pictures in terms of the internal structure that's going through this, but there's some sp spaces where the internal structure gets quite close to the, um, uh, to the acrylic, which then you get hot spots. Um, so there's a bunch of work we had to do uh, swapping to, to really small LEDs. 
um, and stuff like that to, to make it illuminate nicely throughout. Um, so yeah, and then from there, oh, we get the video now. Uh, so we did this on a slip tube system. Uh, so the install was actually kind of anticlimactic. It was a 10 minute thing of, oh, disappeared. Oh, that's all right. I imagine that's just our producer on the back end making sure that the, the video runs correctly. This is the lovely thing. This is how you know it's live. Yeah. <laughs> you were saying sort of about it being a, a, quite a simple process, though, like a sort of a 10 minute anticlimax. Yeah, so it just got lifted off the truck. Uh, there's there's tubes within the sign itself that match tubes that already been installed to concrete on site. So it's just a case of the or the the crane truck uh, slipping one set of tubes over the other, just right into place and and uh, connecting the electrical, and it was done. That's fantastic. I was going to say, isn't that so funny too? Eh? After months of of well, I assume you know weeks and months of working on something to just sort of see it in place is almost surreal. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's really fantastic. Um, yeah, so that was, I think, kind of the project. Is there any questions? Uh, actually, I, I do. I have a few. Um, I love those kinds of projects where you have to do all sorts of um, in-house kind of research and development. Um, I was just wondering, do you work with Core 10 a lot, Tristan? Um, I just the reason being is we do a little bit, but how do you find that it the the rust process like does it bleed onto the concrete? Does it kind of leave a discoloration? That sort of thing. Uh, we have some customers that are you know wanting to know how this is going to affect long term. Uh, like the rust by nature, right? So it leaves rust stains. Um, I'm actually surprised with this one. So like when we were building it and planning it, we're, we're having a lot of internal discussion of this is just gonna leave a massive rust stain on the ground. Um, and uh, and in the finished photos, there's actually another piece that's uh, <laughs> around, which wasn't installed by us. Um, you can't really see it, I don't think in any of the photos that we have here, but um there's court and steel embedded in the ground uh just at the base you can only just barely see it in those photos um but so there's a lot of court and on site there um surprisingly it ha like there's a little bit of rust on the 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 pavers that are there but it's it's not really that much so i'm, I'm surprised at how well it, how clean it's it's left the site um, it definitely, when we were preaching it here in the shop, it, it left a rust stain on the floor that I don't think is completely gone. So uh, it, it does leave a little bit of a mess. But uh, the, again, the, the client wants something that's living over time and changing over time. And um, that, that's really what they're going for and, and something they're willing to accept. I would. No, sorry, please go ahead. I just, it looks amazing. And I, I, I totally get how that doesn't. Um, like it's not, it's a huge sign, but it's uh, got so many different components to work out that it's, uh, there's a lot of time and resources that get put into it. So it's a very, very beautiful sign. Yeah, no doubt. Sure. I, I would ask Mike, um, you know, if, I mean, this is something that we don't always necessarily have the opportunity to comment on, but I'm curious, you know, when you're talking to a customer specifically about something like this, like a, having to choose the right material for a job is almost as important, I would wager, as choosing the right machine for the job, right? I mean, um, have you had customers who've wanted to achieve certain, you know, looks from a, a piece of signage or something like that, and then you've had to sort of steer them towards perhaps a reverse or, you know, who knows what it is in order that they can try and get that, but still have that that you know reliable weathering over time yeah i certainly do i but i i, I think the the big the big what tristan had said earlier was i think the optimum word there was he was dealing with art with the architects right and and it's the architects who dictate typically and you guys can correct me if i'm wrong but normally what i hear from people is that the architects are telling us we have to do this, this is what the client wants what we have to to match up with right is that normally that normally what happens with you guys, Tristan, Helena, Dave, you know, I mean, the architects will tell you it has to be this way and that's normally what has to be done, right? So. Yeah, I, 
think to some extent it's a bit of an advisory role a little bit. So you have yeah. back and forth a good discussion about how do you build this, um, you know, how can we achieve these different looks and. You know, the, as I said, this one was a six month debate because they, they wanted something that uh, initially we kind of said wasn't doable. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. there were some yeah. lengthy, lengthy meetings trying to figure this out. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, try, and you know, there, there, there was a solution that basically got negotiated out of it kind of thing to, to meet their vision and, and get something that looked really cool. But uh, you know, we don't want it to look bad either, right? So uh, they want it to look amazing. We want it to look amazing. Um, so we, we have to sit down and figure out how to, to meet that vision as, as closely as we can and, and make it look great. So um, yeah. everyone was at least on the, on the same page there. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, you, it goes back to your question, Don, is that, you know, these, you know, these people, these three people here are experts in their field and their, and, and, you know, people are relying on them to help them out and everything like that. And it's that experience. And, and it's amazing how much, you know, you see this silly, you see this, not a silly sign, but you see a simple sign that goes on, you know, in front of a building or on a building or whatever, but it's amazing how much work is done in the back end and how much negotiating may go on, you know, and, and there's just so many, you know, you know, forks in the road sometimes that you have to go down. And, and I'm sure these guys can, can, you know, can tell you about a hundred different forks that they've had to go down the road, you know, when they're dealing with the architects, it's for them, the architects, it's their vision, it's their baby, it's their, you know, it's what they envision and they pass that on to the, to the customer, their customer who then wants, Tristan or Helena or Dave to come up with something that, yeah. you know, shows that vision. I'm sure we've all had that experience of somebody coming through the door with a ton of ideas as well. What, you know, what are you looking for? I, I really want something that's going to be awesome. Like, right. <laughs> but <laughs> more concretely, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> um, I did want to, uh, sorry, go ahead, Helena. Dad, let me ask what their budget is. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. I'm afraid so, yeah. What level of awesome are we talking about? <laughs> uh, would you be able, Helena, uh, to talk us through the, the, the Project PCNC screen here, the, the, the Museum for Human Rights? Sure. Um, so I guess right from the beginning, it was um, a bit of, it was a project that I, I assume a lot of people were very interested in. It's the fe a federal museum outside of Ottawa. And um, we, when we were asked to bid on it, um, we didn't know this at the time, but we had been shortlisted um, from um, one of three from across Canada. So that was quite an honor when we got awarded this project. Um, along with that award came a very tight deadline um, and certain costs that had to be incorporated and uh, many samples, many, um, iterations of different types of processes had to be provided um, within this timeline. So we had to get to work right away. And what we did, um, I think what the best thing we did right initially is go into this building and document every location that a sign was going to be placed according to their plans and um, documenting it by a photo, by measurements, and um, yeah, and, and we cataloged it. So that was kind of the starting point for us. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to, to go to this museum. It's an amazing, architecturally, it's an amazing building and um, not a single straight wall is in there. So um, we had to manufacture signs that had to be plumb on um, angled walls. So it was that, was a challenge for us, um, just in the sense that every wall is a different angle. And so we had to um, custom make, and that's our specialty, we had to custom make a frame for almost every sign and uh, with the correct angles and everything. So we referenced that, um, that catalog of, of uh, photos and measurements quite regularly. So that was one of, um, that was basically, uh, you know, a, a really good starting point for us. 
um, going through samples, um, various different, I mean, um, part of the, the project outlined that we had to provide mock-ups um, of different sign types. So once we had worked out all the details of that, um, we were able to more or less get into production. Um, now, you're very correct in saying the front end of this of these projects take up a considerable amount of time. I would say that on average, what the customer doesn't see is about 50% of their project happens in just developing the shop drawing, going through you know the different suppliers and, and making sure you have all the materials involved, involved on site. Once you finally get into production, that's, I'm not going to say the easy part, but for us, then we can relax a little bit. Almost a relief, uh, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone seems to be challenging you guys to do signs that are never on straight angles. That's, oh. That seems difficult. <laughs> Everyone's getting this. <laughs> I wouldn't have the first clue how to approach that. Well, it was interesting. Uh, um, me and another coworker went on site, and we had a level and a measuring tape, and that is how we determined angles <laughs> all over the place. It was um, it was quite interesting, <laughs> but um, one of the things too that was kind of developed, and on this slide you see it, um, it it's a freestanding monument with a touch screen uh, inserted into it, but on the bottom of it, it is braille and tactile. Now there's a fair amount of braille and tactile on there, and we, up until this project, we have basically been doing um, we have been providing interior signs, but we had not been doing them in-house. We had been subbing out the braille and tactile part of it um, because we didn't have the machine. And um, with the with this project, we felt that this was something we needed to bring in-house and so that we can control it because um, on these types of signs, you see that there is, well, we have the French and English um, and Braille for each of those languages. So we have a lot of information being um, applied to these signs and we just needed to be able to um, control that part of it. Um, and we didn't, um, they're large, so that was also a, a thing too. Um, for some of these signs, we actually had to use our CNC machine to do the Braille and tactile, which it's not really designed to do, but we found a way. <laughs> Wow. And uh, uh, we had to put in the braille by hand um, on some of those signs. So yeah, a little labor intensive, but again, the things that you do to make sure that uh, the sign is exactly what your customer wants. Um, and just different types of finishes um, and uh, different types of, of machines that we did use. Um, we had, uh, and like Tristan said, I mean, we have a, a CNC on site, but anytime anything needs to be uh, laser etched or um, laser cut or water jet cut, we do um, try and we, we do have associates that we go to um, and we utilize their services. As um, sometimes it's, but in the case of the Braille and tactile machine, mm -hmm. We felt that that was a good investment at that time, but we don't do we don't do a lot of laser etching. So this part of it is um, is the uh, the donor walls. Um, oh, and it's a good thing that we're on this slide because um, as you can see, it has a Tyndall stone wall. It's a rough cut Tyndall stone wall. Now on this uh, on this wall, we have um, um, individual letters are actually fabricated letters, uh, stainless steel. However, on a lot of the interior walls, um, we have much smaller letters that had to be installed onto these rough cut Tyndall stone walls. And um, there are, the mounting points were so close together that we were finding it was um, starting to break apart the, the wall. And um, that's not our intention. <laughs> we don't want to create more work for our clients and um, by having to fix walls and stuff. Um, but it, uh, the Tyndall stone is a very, um, well, it's a very a lightweight type of a, of a stone. So it does break and chip crack quite easily. So we had to develop a way 
where we could install these le tiny little letters. Um, they were like two and a half inches tall and um, we had to find a way to install them without breaking the, the wall. So what we ended up doing, and this is where we have to try and manage our customers' expectations, um, is we applied the letters onto a clear acrylic and instead of having um, like hundreds of mounting points, we would have four with the um, with the standoffs that we would mount the, the clear acrylic panel to. I probably don't have a, a photo of that in there right now, but but uh, because these were a little larger and with a, you know, if we had to modify it into just two mounting points, then you know these are large enough letters that they could be that could be done with. So. Um, wow. So yeah, we, we had a lot of uh, uh, interesting um, challenges, a lot of interesting um, techniques that were developed through all that. Um, I would say too that um, for our, for me personally, the, the takeaway on this project was that um, I really needed to make sure that I was um, delegating and um, not taking on the whole project on my own, but making sure that my team was all involved. And um, and I would say that they were they were all very invested in, in getting this project out the door and in the place on time. So um, it was it was a it's a great time for all of us. So and a great project to work on. I should say it's I mean to get to work on such a, a momentous. Um museum as well, like such an important building, I imagine, I mean, it comes with certainly um, a lot of excitement and, and it's certainly something to be proud of, but at the same time also, uh, I can't imagine it wasn't without its pressure a little bit as well, right? So I think, I mean, it's yeah. very clear that your team delivered beautifully, but I, I would love to quickly touch on, you know, sort of similar to the, the question I asked you in the beginning of the webinar, I know you must approach something of a certain scale, you know, in a, in a slightly different way. Do you approach something, you know, with such, um, as you sort of mentioned, like finding out that you were shortlisted and finding out that you were selected alone was an honor. Like, do you approach a, a project like this with any sort of, uh, you know, special um, pre-preparation, or is it just like let's just tackle it and let's 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 you know one day at a time sort of thing? Well, we do when we when we quote on something like this, we kind of formulate a plan and how this is all going to work should we get the the award. And, um, and that does help us with that. I mean, it's very basic. It's like, who's going to be responsible for this, who's responsible for that? Um, because we don't really know until we get into it um, how much um, this is all going to take. Because we were awarded the interior and exterior, but then the donor package came on uh, afterwards. So um, that almost doubled our, our work because there's so many donor opportunities within that museum that and every one of them has individual black cut letters. And yeah, we had, there was a lot of, uh, of installation and just even over like you're, you're on a wall, but you're hanging over a couple of, of uh, floors because there's that, um, the, the ramp system, the alabaster ramps, and uh, it's on one wall, but you don't have any support or any way of getting, um, like, it, and we had to be a little creative in trying to find our scaffolding and, and how to get up <laughs> onto those walls in some areas. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was definitely um, a fun challenge to have to look into, so. Super fun, as long as it's not me out on that scaffolding. That is so scary. Um, uh, last but certainly not least, I would love if, uh, Dave, if you would talk us through, I believe this was the project you mentioned, the, the Greystone Racket Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Um, Please. So this is, this is a project that we just did recently, um, and it's kind of interesting to... Um, to try to get a little bit of larger materials. Well, I guess just during COVID, a lot of stuff is harder to uh, harder to get. Um, so just one of, one of the challenges with just sourcing uh, larger um, some of the larger pieces for materials to to fabricate. Um, as I said, uh, Greystone Racket Club. It was um, 
so it was a racket club to begin with, um, and then new owners, new branding, um, and really just, I guess, as you can see on the screen right now, uh, they wanted, or the G and the shield um, is a big part of their branding. Um, and they, um, so what we tried to do um, with that is give it more of a 3D effect um, with with all of the signs that, that we built with. So um, you can see the, the G, all the black pieces, that's, um, that's quarter inch black acrylic. And then on top for, for this specific sign, there's just, uh, it's on top of aluminum composite panel um, for that. So we did all the exterior signs and uh, all the interior signs as well. Um, so you can just see there's a um, little bit more of a closer, uh, up close photo of that. Um, and you can see, so um, the two photo or the two signs there, so we did both of those. Um, both of the shields are both on aluminum composite with black acrylic and then the gray stone and racket club that's actually on um, uh, quarter inch aluminum uh, itself, just because we thought it would weather a little bit better um, in the elements. And for the ground sign, so we were using a, an existing ground sign. So the gray base was there. And then there is a, another topper um, from the previous clients. So what we uh, did is we took off the existing uh, top piece of the sign and then we installed a push, push through for the Greystone Racket Club. And then um, for the shield itself, um, we created uh, some push through cans on top to give it a little bit more um, kind of status and um, and you can see it uh, yeah a little bit better so that's a bit more of a close up of the exterior um, signs. Quite a question for you on those ones if we're just yeah. back one slide like those look massive is it like is it multiple sheets of acrylic and uh, yeah yeah no that's a good call so. For the for the G, um, I guess on for the gr the G, the G that's on the screen, uh, the G is one piece of acrylic, and then um, the shield pieces on the exterior they're seamed in the center um, of the yeah right there and the top and bottom of the center. So they're actually um, multiple pieces of of acrylic and um, yeah. So and are you worried, like, so you've got acrylic on aluminum composite panel, which mm -hmm. are different materials that will heat up and cool down at different and expand and diff contract at different rates. Are you worried about that at all? And how did you make sure it's going to stay together nicely? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Because, yeah, as you definitely know, with the exterior signs, um, acrylic definitely expands and contracts. Um, and so it's really for uh, for these signs we just use double-sided tape um and some of the same same tape that we use for most of our installs which is and just uh um i believe this tape is 3m i'm not sure what exact um model it is um but we we do have some other similar signs that are quarter inch acrylic um that we have done in previous years and we found that they've held up um, for the most part, um, in the in the elements, obviously, the the larger you get, the um, uh, the higher chance, the, the larger of the sign that you get, the higher chance of it expanding and contracting and weathering. Um, but for the most part, for the signs that we made, we, they uh, they weather pretty good. Can I ask uh, really quickly, uh, both uh, Tristan and Helena? Um, how you know sort of in past you've approached sort of the the a similar problem so you know talking about that that uh, the difference in materials or specifically how you would approach something uh being outdoors to ensure that it is going to have that same impact and that same look you know a year from now five years from now ten years from now that sort of thing uh tristan perhaps to you first yeah i'd say most of our stuff is built out of aluminum um and you know that's very durable it will you know when we do our kind of our whole painting coating at the end, it's going to last and look great for a long time. Uh, the reason I brought up the question is, yeah, we we have concerns if someone comes to us and they're looking for like an eight foot continuous piece 
And, and like we've had requests for outlining things in a push through acrylic before, um, which we've tried and it hasn't been super successful just because the expansion coefficient of acrylic and aluminum is, uh, is different. And you know, as they heat up in the sun or uh, freeze in the winter time, um, you know, they're, it's, you get, they, they, they both change sizes and it's going to start to, uh, you know, if it's not done well or done, you know, either if it's, it's not done well or just in some cases, if it's just too big, it's going to expand and contract too much and come apart. So we try to steer people away from, uh, from going too big on the acrylic pieces outside uh, just because we, we have concerns about the longevity of it. Yeah, and that, I mean, I've seen that happen even with the engraving plastic, you know, where somebody wants to put a standoff sign or, or screw a sign to the side of a building and the, yeah. the holes are too tight for the screws and the screws are, are expanding different than the acrylic and then the acrylic starts to crack and everything. So again, you know, it's silly little things like that that, you know, you have to take into account when you, especially when you're working outside, you know, as these guys know, I mean, it's just the, the, the weather will just change your your materials so quickly and if you've got different ones together it's certainly something you've got to think about when you're putting it uh, doing the finished product so yeah. yeah and then the other one that uh we often run into is people are looking for wood which wood degrades over time right so we do do it um you know there's a lot of work that goes into kind of finishing it and sealing it and making it look great um but there's also some kind of cool uh um it's uh, kind of it's aluminum, but made to look like wood, and it's got like a nice wood grain texture to it. Uh, so we try to. It has its limitations as well, because if you like cut it, you see the aluminum inside. But uh, uh, we try to steer people to that where it's appropriate, and that that will look good for for decades, no problem. Um, yeah. So there's always and yeah, there's always challenges when you have interfacing two disparate materials. Absolutely. I would say uh, in particular too, Dave, I noticed on some of the, the photos that were sort of uh, later in the presentation, um, the the shield installation you guys did, particularly when you see it up close, the, the materials that you've chosen, it gives such a brilliant luster to the logo on the wall. I think it's super, super effective. I think it's really, really beautiful, uh, particularly, yeah, so perhaps one earlier there, if you don't mind, uh, this one in particular, I noticed, yeah, the, the combination between the, the shine on the acrylic there, and then also the shine on the aluminum that it's sitting on top of, I think is incredibly, incredibly effective. It really gives that impression of being a shield whilst also um, you're, you're sort of drawn to the logo itself and then across, right? It's it's really, really effective in my mind. Yeah, thanks, Don. Yeah, do, you have, do you have backlighting on the graystone there, Dave? Um, on some of our shields, so like this one, that is a halo gotcha. lit um, mm -hmm. sign. Um, so the golf facility that's pin mounted um, and the, the halo lit sign that's um, obviously uh, off the wall a little bit. So then you get that nice glow. And then we did an exterior sign um, as well that's halo lit too. So that's one of the types of signs that we're starting to do a lot more um, for interior and exterior are halo lit signs. So um, halo lit is just with the lighting around the edge? Is that just to, for people that would be don't know what it is? So. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's the glow you see when marketing staff pass you by, Mike, around each of us. <laughs> um, I don't see them very often, Don. They don't normally come up to it. Yeah. Yeah, I walked right into that one. Um, so certainly, uh, as we said in the beginning, and if you're, if you're just tuning in, um, you know, this will be available on our YouTube channels. Uh, but really quickly, I wanted to uh, thank all of our panelists. We have some uh, submitted sort of moderator questions here that I would love just two or three to take it in turns to go, uh, you know, to speak with each of you. And then obviously, obviously, you know, please anyone feel free to cut me off uh, with any questions of your own. Uh, if you have some questions in chat that you'd like to drop in that we can throw in, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, so I want to ask each of you, uh, over time, have you noticed any major shifts in the type of requests that clients are making uh, I'd love to go to Helena first on this one, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I'm, I think as far as um, the shifts that I've seen, um, I don't know if they're major or not, but um, maybe more providing an all-inclusive. Uh, I mean, as kind of uh, being a one-stop shop, right? You, you provide the parking lot signs, the exterior signs, the interior signs, <clears throat> banners, whatever. Um, it's become more 
of a package that we've been off been able to offer and has been requested from us. So that's what I've seen um, as a major shift. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, Dave, how about yourself? Um, yeah, I'd say for major shifts, I mean, obviously, I think it's kind of similar to what Helena said initially with, uh, you know, clients coming in with uh, some some large and, and big ideas. And then it really just comes down to budget and or feasibility uh, um, with it. But really for um, for most of the signs that, that we are doing and, and a lot of uh, municipalities around here um, who are starting to mandate or getting out of the, the old sign boxes, um, mm -hmm. just uh, which is uh, or nowadays the LED lit um, sign box with acrylic and then vinyl on the top. And a lot of them are going more to channel letters or push, mount, uh, push through signs, um, kind of like Tristan, you said. Uh, Obviously, the larger you get, um, the less feasible those those signs are. Um, but just a lot more of the municipalities seem to be, and just uh, even landlords are looking for nicer nicer looking signs to make their make their buildings um, and companies look look a little bit nicer and, and sharper. Certainly, uh, Tristan, how about yourself? I. I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, kind of in the illumination space, you know, I think Neon's back um, to some extent, at least, you know, Neon used to be the, the illumination of choice that kind of died out as LED came in. We're seeing it come back for, uh, for a lot of kind of retro vintage trendy type stuff, you know, bars, restaurants that want to stand out in some way, the, the artwork statement piece. Um, yeah. And then I'd say maybe kind of the second thing we're seeing is we're seeing a lot more, uh, kind of raw materials, either kind of raw materials or aged materials. Um, so like if we looked back at kind of the, the Great Northern Way uh, project I presented there, um, you know, you had uh, court and steel, which was an aged material. Um, and then the tenant panels were raw to be stainless, um, which, you know, a, a little bit challenging in, in itself because it doesn't come out of the mill normally without scratches. We actually had to sort through with a bunch of stainless steel trying to find pieces that would be cut out without scratches. Um, yeah, and I, and I think the challenge there is making things look new. We're set up to do that. We've got a nice, beautiful paint booth and we can we can make things look, look beautiful that way. Making things look old or beaten up or weathered or um, that's a whole other challenge itself that is actually, I think, in a lot of ways a bit more difficult. Absolutely. One, one of the things that, you know, certainly stood out to me um, in getting to speak with, uh, well, all four of you certainly, but uh, is the level of innovation that, um, you know, you've had to sort of bring to recent projects, I think, to sort of speak to what Dave was saying that, you know, um, very often you're not able to maybe fall back into old habits or old patterns that you're really having to push. Uh, you know, I think about Helena, like you said, sort of making the C and C do braille, right? I mean, like finding new ways to deliver what it is that the client is looking for that are maybe, you know, outside of the box. Can you do this? Like, well, I don't know yet, but let's find out, right? Let's see if we can make it happen. Um, sort of to that point, I guess, uh, modern projects often incorporate uh, lighting, digital pieces, that sort of thing. Um, how do you take these components into account when designing a project? I will go uh, back to Tristan, if you don't mind. Uh, so that's a huge part of what we do. Um, and, you know, it's a lot around kind of the selection of what you're doing. Um, uh, you know, and I think we we're just talking, you know, a lot of clients are going, you know, push through channel letters, uh, halo up channel letters, we do a lot of those. Um, you know, those are quite popular, but if you get into more art type pieces, um, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into, you know, how are you putting uh, the lighting into something? How does it, um, how does it interact with the materials that, that you're working with? Even sometimes interactions with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the colors that you're, you're dealing with. Um, specifically for halo lighting, we, we sometimes run into the challenge of someone wants to put halo lighting on a black wall, um, which is a little bit difficult to like that. That's one that we're, we still struggle with sometimes in trying to make that look good because of the shadows that are projected and um, the uh, you know black doesn't really reflect light uh, so much. Um, so that, that's something that we you know we we spend a lot of time thinking about. You know maybe as we change the sheen of the the um, 
uh, you know, sheen of the, the paint that's behind it or something like that to, to make it stand out a little bit more, you know, project a little bit nicer. So there's, there's kind of a lot of different thought pieces that go into, you know, the selection of the lighting that you're going to use and uh, how it interacts with the materials around it to, to kind of give an optimal result. Fantastic. Uh, Helena, same question to you. Um, yeah, so basically everything that Tristan said, can I do that? No. <laughs> I <have> all... <laughs> of course, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I guess in, in just further adding to that, <clears throat> um, we do solar panels. Uh, we try to provide that option as well to our clients. And uh, so there's a multitude of things that we need to determine if that is something a, a customer is in wanting to do. Uh, what, what we try to do is try and get that information right off the bat, just so that we can design everything together. Um, installing solar panels can be, um, they can look out of place very quickly. Um, and so either you need to have a place where you can put them or incorporate them into the design, as well as having a place for your batteries. Um, knowing how long they want these uh, signs to be illuminated because they will be on timers and, and it will be sensitive to how much solar uh, power you have stored up. So there's a there's a few things that we try to work through um, when we provide that type of lighting. Um, and, um, and even the digital component, we do do... Um, digital signs so you know location that's always a place uh a thing that we need to determine is where is it located what's the traffic uh who are you targeting um and uh you know who is it that you're trying to uh to target when with these signs sometimes the resolution doesn't need to be as uh as small as they may want they may want to spend the money on on the size of the sign instead of the resolution. So um, all these things, you know, you, you try and, and take into consideration with the lighting and the digital components. Well, that makes sense. Uh, Dave, finally to you, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I definitely echo Tristan, Helena, what what you guys uh, shared, um, and and I'd, I guess to try to add something additional on top of that, uh, really just working with. The client's vision and the designer um, trying to be uh, as creative as they can and the realities of fabrication um, so just really working with all three parties um, to try to come up with um, with an end result that the client is happy with and and loves um, and uh, and with that especially with digital signage um, there's uh, a lot more uh, cities and municipalities are um, coming in with uh, with different guidelines as to where they where you can be putting these signs and kind of Mike you you spoke a little bit about that initially there can be a lot of back end uh, work that goes into these signs to even just see if if uh, if this idea is feasible um, with a certain lighting or the the digital signage that that the client wants um, initially. Well, that makes sense. Um, I have a I have a final question here I wanted to throw up for you. Um, we've sort of touched off on this, but I, I want to sort of build on it a little bit to say, uh, so the question as submitted was, uh, when it comes to precision, so what types of technologies does your team use to achieve accurate results? Uh, do you use different equipment for different materials? Um, we have had the opportunity to speak to this a little bit. What I would like to ask is sort of, you know, not only, again, um, you know, what sort of uh, techniques and what sort of uh, machines you're using day in and day out. But then also I'm curious about where you see sort of um, the future of your business moving. You know, uh, you mentioned uh, each of you, I believe, sort of how things have changed over the course of the time that you've been in business. And, you know, where do you hope to find uh, what it is that you do sort of, you know, five or 10 or 20 years from now? Uh, I would go to Dave first, not to put the, not to put the, you guys are also agreeable. It's wonderful, but it's, uh, I mean, it's difficult to sort of, I'd like to echo my colleagues and add great answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for, for precision, um, well, like uh, Tristan and Helena, so we, we do have a CNC machine as well. Um, and we also do have three, uh, three laser machines um, in our shop, which uh, we, um, our, our lasers that we use are CO2 lasers, so not water. Um, um, lasers uh, that Tristan uh, was was speaking to earlier, and, and we use those daily and, and almost on 
every project where we're lasering a certain component of our signs and definitely um, using the CNC machine as well. Um, and it's just great to uh, to be able to use the the CNC machine and even the laser if you are able to use it. Um, just so much more precise than anything you get all. Um, nice, crisp, clean cut lines if you are using acrylic. Um, and I think, I think that's where things, things are now. And I think they're just going to keep going in that direction. Um, and potentially, uh, just different aspects of, of lighting and, uh, and digital signage where, where it is now to be able to incorporate those a little bit more into, into where, where signs are. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I would, uh, perhaps go over to Helena next. So what we do, yeah, we use a CNC. We have a Braille and tactile machine. Um, we try to steer um, our, our customers to, like Tristan said, into non-wood related uh, materials just because um, wood is not something that uh, it, it, it degrades over time. So uh, the CNC is prime, like is used all the time. Um, I would be interested in knowing what a laser, like does it substitute what uh, a CNC would be able to provide for us? Um, that would be, you know, something to explore as well. And, and maybe um, if, you know, maybe that's another conversation. But uh, um, as far as the equipment that we use for, for precision and, and, uh, and technology, like those, those right now are what we primarily use. <clears throat> so that's, I, I, I would pose that question perhaps even quickly to Mike because uh, I'm sure it's something that a lot of questioners or pardon me customers question about um, you know how does the the laser work as a complement to the CNC more than anything I think is sort of often how we look at it yeah and I mean there's there's certain you know limitations on one machine like a CNC you know is, has limitations on on certain, as, as Tristan said, you know, there were, he was trying to get into those small areas. CNC may not be able to, that 90 degree corner may not be able to do that where the laser can do it. But then, you know, there's other things where the CNC is a lot better than the laser machine in terms of, you know, the more, the more varied materials that you can use. So again, you know, that's, that's the beauty of having all that equipment in house that, you know, you can sort of bounce around between the, the, you know, the different forms of uh, fabrication equipment, as Tristan said, it's nice when you've got somebody across the road too. So if, you know, if you have the limitation, it makes it easy to run across the road and get it done. Well, yeah, when you have that fortunate neighbor with four water jets. When we first got our CNC or when we were contemplating getting the CNC for the first time, um, we, we're really debating because we had somebody that we were using that had a CNC machine and um, didn't, um, and it wasn't that costly. And it was just a time frame, like it was a turnaround, right? Ideally, you want to have everything in house, but sometimes it just doesn't make dollars and cents to have to have it. But once we got the CNC and we realized how much we actually used it it just became such an invaluable tool. So that's why, you know, you're never quite sure until you make that plunge. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you go, if you go one step further to that, I mean, you can't be an expert in the field if you don't have the equipment to a certain yeah. degree too. Right. I mean, that's the big thing, you know, I mean, it, it, I can go back to just, you know, people ask about a rotary attachment and I always tell them, I say on the laser machine and I always say, well, you can buy the rotary attachment later on, but what are you going to do? Well, you're going to, if you don't buy the rotary attachment when you get the machine, then you're going to wait for that big order to come in. And then the big order is going to come in and then you're going to order the rotary and then you're going to go, geez, how do I use this thing? Yeah. And then, you, you know, the next thing you know, you're trying to get it. So, you know, it's always nice when you have that equipment because you understand how, how the machine relates to the equipment that you're working with and everything like that. So it makes you just that much better of a, you know, uh, a knower of how materials will, will work and how they go together and everything like that. So again, as you said, that, that one-stop shop, uh, finally, I, I would ask Tristan the same question. Uh, you know, in terms of machines I want, I want all of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> uh, 
in terms of machines I can afford, uh, yeah. that's another conversation. Um, yeah, I think it's it's better to have the stuff in house if you can. Uh, and it really comes down to two things: or be the the turnaround time and your ability to innovate with it um, would be a big one. Um, you know, we we push our CNC machine in a lot of different ways to you know, try different things and, and stuff like that. Something you can't really do if you're if you're sending it across the, which I guess you can kind of do it if you're sending it across the street or whatever, but you, you have less options to, to try to pull something new off of, um, if, you know, someone else has a certain way of running their shop and their machine and all that type of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I think my- No, that makes sense. Small, small additions to that, that question. Absolutely. We've already gone 20 minutes over. I don't want to keep the three of you too much longer. Certainly, um, if you have the opportunity, I mean, anyone who's watching this either now or in the future, uh, I would definitely not hesitate to reach out to any of the three of them, uh, particularly if you are local either to, to BC or to Manitoba. Uh, if you're here in Ontario, obviously, I mean, these really are some of the best in the field. Uh, do not hesitate to reach out either to them or to Trotec Laser. We're we're all right. Uh, we, we like to think we do a pretty good job. Um, I would like to thank the three of you again so, so much for taking part today. Dave, Helena, Tristan, all three of you, thank you so much. Uh, Mike as well, obviously, thank you. Um, again, don't hesitate to get in touch with either us or uh, one of the three of them. If you have any questions sort of following on from the webinar, uh, we will definitely, exactly, thank you so much. So we'll post all the panelist information in the description of the video so you can always reach out. Uh, we thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you again next week on Friday with another great video. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. See you guys. Thanks. Take care.